Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. The Kamala text I'm getting are so many. I don't know if somebody filled out something and put my number uh, or if it's just the person that had my number before me is a registered Democrat or is getting all these texts. I mean, I get three to four texts a day that they almost make me crash into other cars. It's kind of dangerous to text the amount that they're texting. Do you approve of Kamala? Are you donating? We're short of our fundraising goal. Do you want Trump to it? Like the amount that they are texting people, I feel is unsafe. No matter how you feel about the election or who you're voting for, the amount of texts that you get from the Democratic Party and maybe from the Republicans, I don't even know. But the text that you are getting right now I'm in the middle of the 405 and I'm just getting lit up by Kamala Harris text. Are you showing up for Kamala? Stand up and be counted for Kamala. Kamala Harris is now the Democratic nominee for the president of the United States. Uh, she's doing better than I thought, but we haven't, you know, it's, it's, we are still in the infancy of her candidacy. The thing about Kamala is she is a competent politician, not much more than that. So tightly scripted speeches. She's attractive to a degree. She is professional. However, if she goes off mic... If she goes rogue, it, it could be over. A collection of sound bites from her could doom the entire thing. And her staffers know that. Most of them have left. About 90% of Kamala Harris's staffers have left because she throws things at them and yells at them, which I support. Um, what is the point of having the big job? Kamala also is somebody who is aware that she's kind of unprepared for the job. She knows that. She was the guest for a dinner at DC News mogul David Bradley's home and like a salon style event where he hosts journalists and newsmakers and people. She had so much anxiety about being at the dinner. She had her staff hold like a mock dinner for her where she's like, okay, you act like a big donor. I'll be me. Let's all sit around the table. You're, you know, going to ask me a question about Israel. I'm going to try to respond. So she has the foresight to know that she's not ready or prepared to do the job, which in and of itself is a positive for her. She's, she's doing all these things and they may help. The mock dinner may help her. The thing about America, it's never been more clear that America doesn't have a president and a lot of people don't really want a president. The country is being run by committee and you can guess who the committee is. It's pretty easy to guess the committee. You have many interests in D.C., you have all kinds of power factions. You have people that work uh, in the defense department and the military, the intelligence agencies. You have the billionaire class that has, you know, their representatives in Washington, D.C., pulling the strings, buying politicians, purchasing laws, getting laws made, getting laws thrown out. Um, this is country by committee. This is not country by the president. Um, and so Kamala Harris would be kind of a, you know, ceremonial president. She would be there to make people feel good and to deliver, you know, uh, exciting speeches and, but, the committee that is running the country will continue to do the business of running the country. That's 
kind of what we've seen. I mean, everybody was dogging, you know, Biden, like, which is, you know, they were right. They were like, he's too old. He can't do it. He's senile. He's out. They dump him and they up her. And they're basically like, she will carry on uh, the legacy. The Republicans still have an advantage, but it's not that big. And they could lose it if they're not careful. They can't run on the shooting because by November, everyone will have forgotten that shooting existed. They're already done with that. The media is kind of already done with that, by the way. We don't have a motive. We don't know how the guy got on a roof. We, we, but, but they're already done with that. They're already moving on. They're like, yeah, let's, let's move on with that. Kim Cheadle, the head of the Secret Service, has resigned. She's the head that rolled, and everybody's kind of like, look, they fucked up. She resigned. Now, Kim Cheadle, our friend Kim Cheadle, get that video up. Kim Cheadle uh, was the one who put evacuated Dick Cheney on 9-11. She has been around. Kim Cheadle is one of the real housewives of the deep state. She has been in the dungeon, uh, in the dungeons of the American government for a long time. I mean, look at young Kim Cheadle with Dick Cheney. Play that video. She would know. The 28-year veteran was on the team that evacuated Vice President Dick Cheney on 9-11, and she served on then-Vice President Biden's protective detail. He named her director in mid-2022. Amid a swirl of controversy over the agency deleting nearly all of its text messages from January 6th, the agency says that was due to a data migration. System migrations happen. But I think for a lot of Americans, it just doesn't pass the smell test, given the timing and the volume of messages deleted. Well, it's unfortunate that that would be the assumption that people would make. Our integrity is everything, and there was nothing nefarious attached to that. Their integrity yeah. has... So you're working late again this week with your secretary? I feel like maybe something's going on. Well, that's unfortunate that you think like that. <laughs> My integrity is everything to me in this agency. Kim Cheadle's job is to come out and lie. That's her job. That's what her job is. And she does it. Uh, you know, she's expressionless. She comes out. She sits there. And her job is to lie. They go, yeah, you guys deleted all those text messages on January 6th. That's weird. And she goes, yeah, well, sorry you feel that way. Sorry you feel that way. I'm Kim Cheadle. Sorry you feel that way. That That is her job in the federal government is to come out when something happens, she comes out and lies about it and then goes back, you know, into the dungeon of American the American government. And then when they, and they tell her, they call her, they go, you, you got to go out. We had a bunch of undercover people in January 6th. Not to say that there weren't a lot of lunatic MAGA people there. We, we've all, we know that. But we had some undercover people in January 6th. We can't let people know how many because like the Whitmer kidnapping, 13 of them or 12 of the 15 of them were FBI informants or agents. So they're like, we lost all credibility. No one's talking about the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping anymore, the governor of Michigan, because it was an FBI plot. It was completely hatched by the FBI, and they were the ones who were doing it. You can't even, you can't go to court with that. A judge is going to go, are you serious? So wait a minute, two of you are not FBI, but the rest of you are, and this never would have existed without the feds? We're not going to, they could not indict it. It could not try the case because there's so many FBI. So they're basically, people wanted to know like how many feds were involved with J6? Like how many of them are out there? So of course the secret service, everybody's deleting all of the messages, text messages going, Hey, and then she's got to come out and they got to tell her, they got to go, Kim, you, you got to go out there and you're going to have a kind of a softball interview where a reporter is going to go, hey, so all those text messages on January, so what happened to them? Oh, it's a data migration. 
Uh, so all of them got deleted. And then she's going to go, well, you know, a lot of Americans feel like that's kind of, and she goes, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry they feel that way, but that's, you know, that's unfortunate because our integrity is everything. And as she says it, as she says, she's not great at this. She's not bad at, because she's so dead inside. Make it big. Make that fake. This woman has seen things that would keep you up at night. The things that she knows would keep a regular human being up at night. She decided a long time ago she wanted to be in the inner sanctum of power. And when you're in the inner sanctum of power, the things that you hear can get you killed. How many people over here to Clinton's talking? I mean, they're out. You know, and uh, how many people that you can look back during Iran-Contra, Reagan got lit up, and then you have George H.W. Bush sitting on a plane salivating at his chance to take, you know, the, the big chair and to be the president, and he's sitting there with a bunch of other guys. Get that photo. You want to see a fun photo? Get the photo of George H.W. Bush on the plane watching, uh, waiting to hear if Reagan died or not. Get that photo up with a bunch of, and it's George H.W. Bush, and they're all sitting on the plane with a bunch of goons, and he's waiting because Reagan, we want to talk about assassination attempts, right there to the left, first one. So there they are, and they're all waiting to find out if, yeah, they look innocent, huh? Bunch of, a bunch of uh, innocent guys. They're all waiting on that plane to, f to know if Reagan died. They're all there waiting, going, because now he's the acting president. What I mean to say is that these things aren't new. These, um, uh, you want to call them power grabs or coups or whatever. And the people like Kim Cheadle, their job is to just come out and they have, they're always expressionless. They don't have expressions on their faces. They, it's amazing. When you look at her, if you go back to her face, she doesn't smile. She doesn't frown. Uh, she basically just, it, it's literally the party line. This is the party line. That's what it is. The text got deleted. The cameras in the Epstein jail went off. Uh, the roof was sloped. She is... One of the lower members, now she's very in the inner sanctum, but she's the one that has to go out and make a buffoon out of herself. She's not on the top level of guys that you never see or hear about. She's the one that comes out to make kind of a buffoon of herself with anything they give her. And she probably goes, wait, wait, what? You want me to say what? And they go, yeah, yeah, we're going with that. The slope roof. She goes, you expect me to go out on the air and say that the J6, all the texts were lost in a data migration. They go, Kim, Kim, this is your gig. And she goes, oh, fine. And then she goes out and she does it. And that's her job. That's her job. Her job is to go out with whatever they cook up, whatever they decide, she's got to go out. Now, this one was tough because the president almost got whacked on national television. So now they go to her and they go, Kim, they knock on her door. She's got a little door. She's got an office like her office. You ever see the West Wing where Ainsley, who's the Ann Coulter character in the West Wing, uh, the right wing uh, lawyer that the White House hires, they put her in an office in like the bowels of the White House. Ainsley's office is in like, uh, right. She's in like the steam room of the White House. She's like under the White House. Now, this woman is the head of the Secret Service, so her office is a little nicer than that, but it's not great. She's not. This is not like one of these offices. Uh, yeah, let's see if you can get a picture of her office. I doubt you can, but maybe, no, they're not going to show you her office. You'll never see this woman's office because it's not that great. It's not as bad as that girl's from the West Wing. And they knock on her door, and they say, Kim, and she's probably sitting at her desk, and she's got a Diet Coke, and they go, the calls are growing louder. I mean, look at this one. Look at her face, this woman. Do you know this is a trauma victim? And I mean, by that, I mean, she's the one doling out the trauma, but still it's consumed her. Look at her face and what this woman knows. 
the things that this woman has been forced to internalize for power, to live with. The bodies that she knows where they are buried. The things that she knows about everything. The things that I wish, or I even, maybe I don't wish I knew. The things that I think or that I've read about. The worst, you know, um, inclinations that uh, I have about the way that this country is run. This woman has seen them all up close. And been a party to them. And been involved. So they come, they knock on her door. They go, Kim, you got to go. It's time to go. The calls are growing louder on the hill. You got to step down. We got to move on, Kim. Now you got to realize all of this is, is somewhat orchestrated. Whether, whether you think the shooting is or not, we're going to get to it in a minute. The public relations handling of this is all. Organized. She steps down. Biden steps down. Kamala gets upped. We're moving on. We're moving on. Now, all my friends who were like, Kamala can't win. We don't like Kamala. They all, my big liberal friends, are all in for Kamala now because overnight, it's just, she's in. It's the future. And by the way, it could work. It may work. It may work because the thing about the shooting that makes it such an amazing event for people is it is so dark And so people want to move on from it. Trump did an amazing job at the convention, not consistently going back to that, going to the well. He mentioned it, he goes, I shouldn't be here, but he gave a really positive speech that was very presidential. Now, the fact that the shooting is, is so dark and so troubling and the implications of it, if it wasn't a lone nut gunman, the implications are so troubling. People don't really want to go there. You can't go there. I mean, I know people are human beings. They're, they wake up, you get the kids lunch, they go to work, you know, they come back. Or are we going to go to, where are we going? Are we going to Cabo? Are we going to take a vacation? Are we going to go to wherever, Martha's Vineyard? They're, they're, they're not really on the frequency of did does this guy Thomas Matthew Crooks have any prior relationship with any government agency? Was this allowed to happen? Was this orchestrated? People don't want, they can't handle that. So Cheadle steps down, Cheadle steps down, Biden steps down, Kamala steps up. It's kind of a brilliant way to move on. You go, we're moving on now. That was a big whoopsie. You've got Hunter sitting there. Look at the family. Oh, look at the family. He was at Nobu Malibu the other day. My friends saw him. He likes Nobu Malibu almost as much as I do. So he's sitting there and they've got Jill and the whole family and they're very sad. They're leaving the White House. They don't want to leave the White House. Look at Jill. Jill's unhappy and Biden doesn't know where he is. They were going to use him, by the way, like a weekend at Bernie's for four years. This is literally what they were going to do. The national security state was going to use Joe Biden. They were going to wheel him. And this is kind of what they've been doing for the last few years. They were going to wheel him into the Oval Office, give him a teleprompter and let him make a speech. He was not going to be running the country. Kamala Harris will not be running the country. Trump, they do. They are worried that he will run the country. Now, whether you like Trump or not, and there's certainly things that he wants to do that will help the country, and then there's some things that his advisors want to do that will probably hurt the country, and it depends how uh, powerful they are and how loud they are in his ear and the weight he gives their advice, but... You know, the power factions that exist don't want a president. That's not part of the game here. They want an actor. They want a ceremonial actor who will sit there and allow the corporate oligarchy to kind of pillage. You know, and whether Trump will stop them or not, we don't know. He didn't really stop them in his first term. There were things that he tried to do, but a lot of Trump's friends are billionaires, industrialists, people that own 
Fortune 500, Fortune 300 companies. I mean, massive companies. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know how successful he'll be. Every president is going up against the system when they get in, if they want to make change. There's the system and then them. And every one of them has to fight that to a certain degree. Their willingness to fight it, their ability to fight it, how controlled they are. So they were going to have Biden as a puppet, as a weekend at Bernie's guy. He's out. Kamala's going to be in. And people are reacting to it kind of in a, in an interesting way because they're all like, okay, good. We had a traumatic time. Trump got shot in the ear. Biden got COVID. Biden stepped down, but now we've got a new candidate. We're moving on. And the head of the Secret Service resigned. That is, the they're trying to kill that story by going, she resigned, she's out. You want it, heads will roll, here's your head. There you go. And there's a lot of people, people like me that go, okay, who are this kid's parents? Are they represented? Do they have lawyers? Have they made a statement? Do we know much about this guy and his motive other than the fact that, you know, we know where he went to school and a few students came out and said he was kind of a weird guy? Do we know anything about him other than that? We don't have a motive. He's just a guy that wanted to be famous. I mean, again, these are all possible things, but we... We know very little, and there doesn't seem to be uh, any aggressive push from anybody to find these things out that I think are pretty... What are his Google searches, by the way? These are the Google searches they're putting out. I know that one of them was how far Oswald was from Kennedy. Yeah, that was like the day of, apparently. Okay. Uh, he was watching pornography, I guess. Up watching in, porn. Before the shooting. Um. So this 20-year-old <laughs> is ready to kill himself. He's ready to die. He goes to a rally going, I'm going to shoot the president and then I'm going to immediately die. And he knows that because you'd be stupid to not know that. And I don't think he's stupid. Like it, 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 nothing has come out to say that he's slow or he knows he's going to shoot the president and then he's going to get shot. But we don't have a motive. And we don't know why. And then on the Patreon episode that we did, we covered some of these weird theories, which again, we, we don't know anything about this. We don't have any facts. But we did have a, something that you sent me last night that I want to play, which is a, there was a, a hearing, uh, and this was a, is that a, is he a senator? He's a congressman. He's from a congressman from Arizona. Tucson. And he's uh, questioning, I believe the head of the uh, police, was it, is it Butler? PA police? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and he's questioning, and this is a, yeah, Colonel Paris is an interesting line of questioning, but at the end, I find something interesting about the kid's house. So stick with this line of questioning till the end. And again, I would love it to be a lone nut, gunman. All these people that are out there going like, well, it's it's pretty comforting to think everything's a conspiracy. It's like, no, it's not. It's terrible. That's not comforting at all. Well, it, I guess you're much more, it's much more uncomfortable to think it's a lone nut. No, it's much better to think it's a lone nut with a gun. It's America. We are all ready to get killed at any moment by a lone nut with a gun. Absolutely. If this is an organized plot... It's terrible. It's much worse and it's much less comforting. This weird idea that conspiracies are comforting and the idea of random acts are not com like I I I I don't understand what people are trying to say. We'd all feel much better if this was a lone nut with a gun, which it may have been, but we don't know. The idea that it was some type of plot or that it was orchestrated or allowed to happen is much more terrifying than it being a lone nut. Here is the... I just don't understand. People call me. I have friends that call me. They're like, well, are you pushing a conspiracy theory about this? I go, I don't even know what happened. Do you know what happened? No one knows. Mm. People don't... Re well, yeah, he was a young man and he was sexually frustrated. You don't even know that. I understand that incel thing you're trying to do and maybe it's true, but you don't even know... What have you? We don't even have a motive. We don't know what happened. 
And I mean, well, there's a lot of people in this country with guns. Yes, we know. Yes, good. We're aware of that. I'm aware of all of that. But the amount of failures suggests something. And then this bitch steps down. That's not nothing. She has been working in the government since Dick Cheney got evacuated from the attack he planned. She's been around for a long time. For her to step down is a thing. Uh, there were bomb assets that we provided. Mr. Chairman, can I have 30 more seconds? Yeah, yeah, I'm letting everybody kind of Okay. Go. On the night of, since then, none... Uh, Did you get any reports from any of your agents of anything fishy at the home? I was briefed on... Uh, was there any silverware found in the home or trash? I, I have no, nothing in the briefing that I was given, sir. Was it extremely clean, almost like a medical lab? Were you given any of those reports? I was not given any of those details, sir. Okay, answer. that's what I'm hearing. Interesting. Um, the last thing I want to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman, this is an uh, article, opinion from, uh, I believe, the Washington Post by Robert Kagan. A Trump dictatorship is increasingly inevitable. We should stop pretending. This, is comp this article compares Trump to Caesar and attempts to justify the assassination of President Trump. And I think even though we want to dodge around it and not make this partisan, I think we all know that a lot of this has to do with the rhetoric, the very violent rhetoric that has led up to this. So what's interesting about the questions he was asking about the House is, and, I, and I, again, I don't know this guy. This is the first time that I've been made aware of this person and I don't know who his sources are, but he's saying that information that he's gotten is that the house was kind of, you know, that they, they, they he goes, what did they find silverware or was it like a, a laboratory, like a surgical setup where it looked incredibly clean and that nobody had lived there or pe people might've known something was going to go down. I don't, I don't really know. It's also maybe worth, bringing up and not to spend too long on it, but this idea that the Heritage Foundation, whether this is, I don't know, true or not, has, there are certain phone numbers that are linked to Thomas Matthew Crooks that have shown up in DC. Um, and this is a tweet. Let me read this. I don't want to pull a bunch of videos on this yet because again, you know, I don't know what's happening. I'm just, I'm here on the case. Nobody else is on the case. I could be having a summer like everyone else. I'm trying to solve the presidential assassination attempt. I should be on a boat. I should be eating clams, which I am still doing this. The Heritage Foundation just released cell phone data of a mysterious figure who made frequent trips between Trump shooter Thomas Matthew Crook's home and a building in D.C. near an FBI office. Nine devices were identified in the analysis linking to both his home and work. He did not act alone. Okay. So we don't know, and again, this is editorializing at that point. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I cannot comment on the veracity of this yet. This, These are stories that are starting to percolate. People are asking certain questions. It's, it's fair to not move on. You can have questions. You don't have to move on. Just because they, you know, Kamala Harris is in there now, everybody's like, it's a big party. Everybody's dancing. And by the way, Amy Schumer, if you want Kamala Harris to win, get the photo off your Instagram. <laughs> All of these celebrities, they ran an article saying Kamala had like unprecedented Hollywood support. You know, she's from California. Let me guess. Your medicine cabinet is crammed with stuff that doesn't work. You still aren't sleeping. You still hurt. You're stressed out. That was how it was for me. So I cleared out my cabinet and reset my health with CBD from CB Distillery. It's a real change. CB Distillery's targeted formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients. No fluff, no fillers, just pure, effective CBD solutions designed to help support your health. In two non-clinical surveys, 81% of customers experienced more calm. 80% said CBD helped with the pain after physical activity. And an impressive 90% they said they've slept better with CBD. If you struggle with a health concern and haven't found relief... Make the change like I did to CB Distillery. And with over 2 million customers and a solid 100% money back guarantee, CB Distillery is the source to trust. I have a 20% discount to get you started. Visit cbdistillery.com. Use code TIM for 20% off. That's cbdistillery.com. Code TIM. CBdistillery.com.
We all love saving money. Spring is sprung, and that means spring cleaning. Whether that means stacking up on cleaning supplies or swapping out your winter clothes for new spring clothes, make sure you're using Ibotta to get real cash back with every purchase. Whatever you're doing in the summer, I'm telling you right now, you're buying things, you're consuming. Ibotta is amazing. It's a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies to toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight that you've been eyeing or that fancy dinner you've been craving. And that's just average. Some people earn more. Other apps give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, just add your offers in the app, upload your receipt, and you get real cash that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Join the over 50 million users and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including all your favorite grocery stores, Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using code TIM when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use the code TIM. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use code TIM. Speaking of California, by the way, Gavin Newsom is getting rid of homeless encampments because he realized, oh, I can't be the president if I run my state like a third world country. So he's removing the homeless encampments. Yeah. So the Supreme Court decision last month that gave local leaders greater authority to remove homeless campers. Gavin is saying he just got passed up for the big job. He got passed up for the big job because the state isn't doing well. Now, what's what's fun about L.A. is the, the people are going to fight this. Like, these crazy liberals are going to, like, they will go out in the streets and they'll be like, you're not getting rid of the homeless. They're my friends. They did this at Echo Park. They had a homeless camp and they, they broke it up. People were out in the streets yelling at the cops because they're like, I buy avocados there. People were over ODing on fentanyl in the tent. But it was like a little farmer's market for some of the, you know, lunatics who live in that area. They would go to that little farmer's market and buy a little trinket from someone and give them money to go buy heroin. Yeah. So, but Gavin Newsom now goes, oh, apparently we can't, we, we, people are like paying attention to like what we do. So they're, they, Kamala Harris and him hate each other. This is all California politics. I, I don't really know, but I know people that know them both well and they don't like each other. Kamala Harris, by the way, the far left hates her because she's a cop, but she was behind a lot of these laws in California, like Prop 47, where they just don't prosecute anything. They don't prosecute like petty theft or petty larceny, whatever they consider, anything under $1,000 if you steal it, smash and grab, stuff like that. They just don't prosecute any of this stuff. That's why you have a lot of people running into stores, grabbing a bunch of stuff, running out. Obama has not endorsed her either. He does not like her. He does not want the first woman, black woman president to be named Harris. He wants her to be named Michelle Obama. But, and, and, and I think that's uh, probably would have been a better candidate, but Michelle won't do it. I don't know why. She won't do it. They may feel that a Trump second term is inevitable and that they would like to clean up four years from now, perhaps. Obama's very upset because he knows she can't win. The Biden family source told The Post. Obama does not like her and he's not supporting her. And he thinks he's going to get trounced. He believes she's incompetent. She was the border czar who never visited the border, saying that all migrants should have health insurance. She cannot navigate the landmines that are ahead of her. This is a quote that somebody gave to the New York Post from the Biden camp. So the Biden camp is trying to sink her. They're trying to sink her. So it's a very interesting period we're in, but you're allowed to not move on from the assassination attempt. I'm going to tell you all that. And that doesn't mean you're a lunatic, doesn't mean you're crazy, doesn't mean you're QAnon, doesn't mean you think Ellen DeGeneres is a clone and that, you know, all of this stuff. It means that you're, you want answers 
about why exactly this happened in the way that it did. This is body cam footage have been released of an officer clearly stating a sniper had eyes on Thomas Crooks, took pictures and called it out sometime before he took a shot at President Trump. Let's play this. Oh, no. So this is the guy that, that are that, that Yes, the that they sent the Yes, it, Beaver County yeah, sniper scene and sent the pictures oh. out. This is him. Okay. All right. Rifle right there, obviously. Got it. So the bike okay. in the back. Hey, one. Is, right is, is, one? is he on that bike? We don't, that, we don't know. So I don't know. So we're just treating that as suspicious device. Oh, one second. I believe the sniper that seen these and sent the pictures is right inside this building. Michelle is Greg. By the way, everybody's standing very comfortably on this slope roof. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Seems pretty comfortable. Where do you think Cheetah is right now? She's sitting in a bar. She's in D.C. in the back of a dark bar, and she's just drinking. What does a woman like Kim Cheetah drink? You know, I don't know what she drinks. She's just sitting there, and she's probably drinking like a Glenlivet or something, like something high-end. You know, she's not a white wine spritzer bitch, right? She's sitting there drinking scotch. It's the back of a dark bar in D.C., and then one of these shadowy CIA types who she's been friends with on and off for many years. He drives up from McLean, Virginia, where they all live, and he's sitting in the bar with her. And by the way, I'm not wrong about any of this. I, I, am, I am very close to what's actually happening. And she's sitting there, and he's sitting there, and he looks at her, and they have a co- they're having a cocktail in D.C. bar. It's the back of a dark bar. And he said, it could have been a lot worse. And she goes, yeah. She goes, it could have been a lot better, too. <laughs> then they sit silently, they each have a drink. You know, you read into that what you want. And then he goes, well, you did the right thing. And she, she goes, she doesn't even respond. She takes another drink. And he goes, listen, sometimes the job just asks too much, you know? And she goes, yeah. He goes, you're going to do great in the private sector. You're going to make a lot of money, you know? And she goes, yeah. She goes, yeah. She goes, but I'll miss it. He goes, well, you're never fully, you're never fully out. You won't be out. There'll be a time when we call you, we make a phone call. She goes, yeah, because this is her whole life, her whole life. If she has a husband and kids, it doesn't even matter. They, they don't even factor into anything that she, you know, I don't know that she does. Maybe she does, maybe she doesn't. But her life is this job. It is this job. It is, it is nothing else. She might have a husband. She might have kids. She might have a wife. She might have a dog. She might have a... Uh, Timeshare. It none of it matters. She doesn't care about anything. She does not care about her little townhouse. She doesn't care about her little cabin in the mountains that she got when she got a bonus. She doesn't care about any of that. Her life, her entire life, is the bowels of the United States government. It is the underground uh, you know, you know, configurations of power that exist. And she is, you know indebted to those people. They have given her a career and they've given her life purpose. This is her entire life. She's not taking any of this lightly. You can see it in her face when she resigned. Do, do we have her resignation? Do we have, was it a statement? Did she yeah, yeah, pull, it up. pull it up? She's had a long career in the bowels of the United States government. And just like she knows someone that is in her position knows that eventually it's time to go. It's very possible she was CIA and then just, assim- you know, became, uh, you know, uh, working for the Secret Service. It continued to work for the Secret Service. They have agents everywhere, people undercover. Cheeto said in her resignation letter that she made the difficult decision to leave the agency with a heavy heart and she doesn't want her departure to distract agents from their mission in light of recent events. It is with a heavy heart that I've made the difficult decision to step down as your director. She acknowledged that on July 13th, the day of the shooting, the agency fell short of its mission to protect our nation's leaders. She further added, from 9-11 to the almost completed Trump assassination, I have always done my duty. (laughs) I have never questioned. When we evacuated Dick Cheney before that anyone knew planes went into any buildings, (laughs) I never questioned it. And when I was told for a total stand down so that somebody could whack Donald Trump on national television, I never questioned it. I have given my life to the bowels of this government, to the dungeons. 
I have stalked the corridors of the undead. I have looked in the gray faces of the bureaucrats who come here from all over the country to uphold these sacred documents that all of our freedoms are emblazoned on and all of these statues that we pass as we walk into these buildings. I have eaten the terrible salads and the horrible lunches. I have laughed at these shitty jokes that all these bureaucrats have made for years. I have sat with politicians and we've had drinks with the leaders of foreign governments. All the while, I have not cared at all about myself, my personal life, the attachments uh, that I should have been uh, uh, being mindful of. None of that mattered to me. This job was everything. This was my entire reason for getting up in the morning. And now I must leave. It is with a heavy heart that I have made the difficult decision to step down as your director. It's not about the pension. It's not about the bullshit. We'll figure all that out. They'll stuff me with money and a bunch of crazy documents to sign before I leave. It's the late night meetings in the park with the shadowy figures. It's the lunches with famous women senators and vice presidential candidates. I feel like I'm really part of something and I'm, I'm really historic. I will, I will miss those. But most of all, I will miss the ugly gray buildings the bowels, the basements, sitting there sipping a Diet Coke, listening to people whose words all garbled together. And then, you know, someone like that's entire career, there's only a few moments of real excitement. But most of it is just gray and boring, but they're waiting and they know that there's going to be a few moments where they are sitting on the cusp of history. And now that is over for her. So even though she is a demon, she is an orc in the army of Saran, you know, is kind of the only way to say it. It is a little bit with a heavy heart that we say goodbye to Kim Cheadle because now she will kind of disappear. Um, she will fade. She will fade. She will go live in Virginia and, you know, She'll talk to people. Maybe she'll talk to the press a little bit, but nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Somebody will pitch her a memoir. Hey, you know, there should be a memoir about you. You're like, you know, female head of the Secret Service. You you were made to take the fucking rap for all that, but I don't really think it was you. And if she's smart, and I know she is, she'll go, get off my property. Get out of here. Because she knows the deal. The deal is you keep your mouth shut. Or here's what also may happen to Kim Cheadle. People have accidents Hiking all the time. Hiking is dangerous. Why don't get involved with it? You go up the mountain. Whoa, the cell phone, sir. What's going on? Where am I? Kim Cheadle may in the next few months have an accident. Car accidents. Drank a little too much on the medication. These things happen. All kinds of possibilities for her. I don't know how she exits. But in her face, she knows that it is a possibility that she is going to be removed because it's like the mafia. It's like the it's the real mafia. And there's only one way out. And I wonder if her resignation isn't a little bit, she understands that. There's only one way to leave that party. It's the summer and it's the summer of car accidents and people wiling out on the roads. And how do you protect yourself? Morgan and Morgan, they are America's largest injury law firm. They have over 100 offices nationwide, more than 1,000 lawyers. With over $20 billion recovered for over 500,000 clients, Morgan and Morgan has a proven track record of fighting to get you full and fair compensation. If you are in an accident, no matter what goes on, First thing you do, you got to call Morgan & Morgan. They won an $8.2 million case against a Florida IHOP. A woman won $3 million settlement over a hot coffee burn. If you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash Tim or dial pound law pound 529 from your cell phone. That's F-O-R, the people.com slash Tim or pound law pound 529 from your cell. This is a paid advertisement from our friends at Morgan and & Morgan. You want them on your side. If you do not have them on your side, you're going to lose. 
And you don't want to lose, you want to win. Getting in an accident, you can't control it. What you can control is getting your money. Get your paper up. That's the part of life you can control. I love going to see events, everything from sports to concerts. I mean, come on, it's the best. Isn't it the best? Have you ever gone out and saw a thing? It's great. You're not at your home. You're, you're out watching some genius. Now, but it's hard to, to kick that all the tickets to it because you're so blown away by the work out there. The work. It's about the work. Game Time app is what I use. I love it. You can get last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, easy to find and buy MLB tickets for every kind of event in your area. Views from all the seats in the venue. So you don't have to, there's no guessing games. You understand that? When you get married, it's still a guessing game. You don't know what's going to happen. You think you've done your due diligence, but really no one knows. No one knows. I know a guy in Massapequa, he literally three doors down, the neighbor, they married 20 years. He's taken out human trafficking, CP, the whole thing on the computer. No one knows. You know what I mean? A week ago, they were eating frozen yogurt. So here's what I mean to say. Here's where there's no guessing games at the Game Time app because then you can look at all the seats and go, that's exactly where I'm going to be sitting. I'm going to be sitting there. That's And there's where will Harry Styles be? He'll be there and I'll be here. Whoa. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. And use code TIM for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code TIM. $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest prices guaranteed. Nobody's enjoying the Paris Olympics. The Olympics have outlived their usefulness. In order to even have the Olympics now, you need to turn the city that the Olympics is in into a maximum security prison. It feels, it's like martial law. They've got gates and fences up everywhere. All the tourists are going to the south of France, which is where you should go anyway. Everyone is ignoring Paris. Everybody. Because France has had a lot of bad terrorist attacks with, with what's going on with Israel, Gaza. There's a heightened state. Now, LA is going to have these when? What year? 2028. 2028, the city of Los Angeles is going to be having these Summer Olympics? Yes. So, at that point, they're going to have to do something very similar. I'm a big fan of getting rid of the Olympics. I know people aren't going to like it. They don't like it. They go, it's sports, it's excellence, it's athletics, it matters, it's good. I say, get rid of it. Fuck it. It's boring. Nobody cares. It's not captivating anymore. It was when I was a kid. Now it's just boring. I've talked about it on the show before. These athletes, their lives are so sad. They live in cars. It's tough. It's depressing now. These people from Appalachia that learned how to ski, then we got to hear about how generations of their family are hooked on fentanyl and they're their only hope to get out there and do the moguls. People are tired of this. It's tiring. I don't want this anymore. We should replace the Olympics with kind of more of a gladiator type thing where it's quick, it's easy, and it, it is this whole idea of like, it need, we need to pick a city every four years, everybody bids on it, and then that city has to run around and go crazy trying to secure everything so that people can, uh, you know, pole vault. It's stupid. Nobody wants this anymore. Get rid of it. Everyone keeps debating NATO. What about NATO? Or should we be in NATO? Get rid of the Olympics. Get rid of it. When's the last time anybody's even been excited about it? You don't even know who's in the Olympics now. When I grew up, people cared about the people that were in the Olympics. Who are the Olympic stars now? Can you get that up? Stars of the Paris Olympics? What are the, you know, does anyone know who these people are? Who are these people? Who are the stars of the Paris Olympics that we're all supposed to care about, by the way? Who are they? Simone Biles was one of them again. Is she the one who refused to compete? Yeah. Last time, but she's better now. 
think so. Oh, enough with her. Anyone else? Noah Lyles? <laughs> There's no Phelps. Where are the Palestinians? <laughs> Where are the Palestinian athletes? This year? I'm serious. Are there at, are, uh, is Gaza sending athletes to the Olympics this year? By the way, would that not send a message if during the opening ceremonies, you know how every country comes out during the opening ceremonies, they let Gaza in and all of these, you know, because during the opening ceremonies of the games, all the countries assemble in this Olympic village. Why not have God and they go and then Gaza comes in and they've got the flag and everybody's shoeless. And it's just 200 random people from Gaza. They're not athletes, but they're just allowed to leave Gaza to go to the Olympics. And they're just in the Olympics. And they just, they're standing there and they keep going. And they're going, help, help. Us! And no one, everyone pretends not to hear them. And they, the, the news anchors go, and that's the delegation from Gaza. Even though they've had a lot of problems this year, they still showed up. It, it speaks to the power of the Olympics. And they're just going, help, please help us. We don't have any water. And he goes, it seems like they're screaming down there. They're so happy. They're so filled with joy to be here with all the other countries. It's really about moving on. It's really about competition, is it? My child is dead. Wow, the delegation from Gaza, really emotional. Many of them are crying at the sight of this. It's such a big deal to be here and part of the Olympics. That's what I think should happen. We should have the, the delegation from Gaza in the opening. Do we have any of the opening ceremonies? Can we play any of them? Uh, it's NBC. I don't think it's technically Why? happened yet. Oh, it hasn't happened yet? Yeah. The secu- oh, it, well, it's happening Ugh, Friday. I hate the Olympics. <laughs> and everyone does. Everyone honestly does. I used to love it. Me and my father used to watch it. We would sit on our couch and eat pints of haagen ice cream and then watch you know, Asian speed skaters with names like Hey Chavo. That's when it was good. That's when it was good. When I believed I could be in the Olympics. When I thought maybe I could be a speed skater. No, that's that's the another one. Hey Chavo. Get Hey Chavo. Not Apollo Ono. I know who he is. What about Hey Chavo? That's a, that was a real, go to get Hey Chavo now. Where's Hey Chavo? Do you remember how to spell his name? Do no, you? of course I don't. <laughs> it's Hey Chavo. If someone knows who Hey Chavo is <laughs> and what they competed in in the Olympics, I think it was Chinese or something that's speed skating. My point is this. We're getting lost in the weeds again. My point is this. No one cares anymore. Remember people used to have names like Peekaboo Street? That was cool. What happened to her? Wasn't she a big les? Who did skiing? Isn't that her deal? Before everybody became non-binary, there used to be something in this country called lesbians, and many of them would ski down a mountain. And I, her name, right, maybe Peekaboo Street's not a lesbian, but I met what a waste of a name if she's not. If you're not eating box with that name, I'm not sure if she. Wasn't she? I don't know anymore. The, the Olympics suck is my point. Oh, she's been married to a guy. Yeah. Sure. The point is, I'm sure she is. I don't know. I just, look at her. She's got a less face. <laughs> what do you want me to do? She looks like uh, alien awareness. Remember the woman who killed all the people? Monster, Charlize Theron. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the first female serial killer. That's what she looks like. Peekaboo Street. My point is that at one point, the Olympics were fun because- America was the dominant power in the world, and it was fun to get our comeuppance every now and then by some of these other countries. Now there's so much strife, and there's so many problems in the world. Is Russia allowed in the Olympics this year? They are. Well, I like that. Eurovision excluded them. Yeah. So Russia's in. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. Wait, Kremlin uses Olympic ban as another arrow to shoot at the West. Only 15 athletes from Russia will compete at the Paris Games under a neutral designation. The Kremlin is framing... See, this is what I mean. You can't have the Olympics anymore unless everyone can compete. 
everyone can compete or no one can compete. Russia needs to be in. North Korea should be in. All of these countries should be in the Olympics. So now we mix sports and politics, Dmitry Gubanayev said. A well-known Russian sports announcer said in an interview, Americans who went to Iraq and later acknowledged the mistake were never sanctioned in the sports world for waging wars. That's true. Russia should be in the Olympics. We can't, if, if people are going to care about, and by the way, that's drama. Russians and Ukrainians going against each other is drama. Israelis and Palestinians going against each other is drama. I am bored. I don't care about Sweden. I want the countries that are at war competing. That's the fun. That's the fun. Because then, you know, those little, uh, you know, those little vignettes they have before the actual event, they'll be like, Tatiana's entire family is dead. They went to fight in the Ukraine and were killed by the uh, Azov Battalion. She's here to defend her family's honor. And then they're like, and it'll be some other girl who's, you know, and uh, also Tatiana, because they're all the same. Also Tatiana, her entire family is dead. She is fighting for the honor of the Ukraine. And then we watch two Tatianas from that part of the world fight for the honor of their country. Without that, what are we even doing? What are we doing? You've got to lean into the world as it is. We can't ban countries we don't like. But it sucks now. Everybody over there says it sucks. They can't get any, anywhere. It's Paris. People want like little pastries. They can't get them. They have to go through like all these fences and they have to have all these security clearances to just get a croissant. It's not fun. It's not funny. We got to let it happen. You got to let it happen. Even if there's a few bombs, even if a few bombs go off, you have to let it happen. It's the Olympics. It's just the Olympics. You have to let it happen. You can't make it so secure that people, they're, they're, I'm telling you right now, if a few bombs go off, it's the cost of doing business. It's the Olympics. It's supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be exciting. Imagine you and all your friends are at the Olympics and you hear a large explosion and you're all running with your croissants, kind of looking at each other, laughing, going, whoa. I told you we shouldn't have come. Shut up. You like it. You're running a little glass of wine. It's supposed to be fun. It's probably boring. Did you hear? You know, it's just fun. Did you hear? But there was a knife attack. There was a knife attack. Yeah, by the track and field. Whoa, really? It's supposed to be an experience for people. And terrorism can add a level of excitement that the Olympics is lacking because it has become boring the stories of the athletes have become boring and depressing, frankly, and sad. And now it's much an element of, of intrigue, terrorism, uh, blood feuds, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, competing uh, for the honor of your nation during a time of war that increased. I could get behind that. It's become a boring corporate snooze fest. You introduce a few blood feuds and a few bombs, I might turn it on. Just my thought. Sad story today. A 10-year-old boy crushed by his foster mom after she sat on him for misbehaving. It's an American story. It's not one we like, but it is an American story. Jennifer Wilson has been charged with involuntary manslaughter. That's interesting. Seems voluntary. (laughs) Involuntary manslaughter after her 340-pound frame caused the death of 10-year-old Dakota Levi Stevens in Berrien County, Michigan, court documents say. A 10-year-old boy was crushed to death after his fatty boon batty mother sat on top of him after he acted up. Jennifer Wilson was apprehended in Berrien County, Michigan and could face up to six years behind bars. Here's the thing. Let me tell you about this, folks. I all day watch these fat women on 
Instagram and they make food and they cook with all processed food. It's disgusting. I'm not going to say who they are. But you know who they are. Like one of them is called like lower middle class mom. There's a few of them. It's a whole genre now of people that use garlic, the garlic in the jar. They use onion powder and onion salt. And they just, they, they use processed food to make disgusting meals. And it's not good. And it's not even cooking. They're assembling. They buy ground beef and they, they, they mash it up. They put it in a pan. They make like tater tot taco bake. It's vomit inducing. These are America's mothers. <laughs> they are America's mothers now. They are all 350 pounds and any one of them could sit on their child. Any one of them. They should see this as a warning. Many of these women probably sit on their children to get their ADHD children to calm down. Because as we've talked about on the show, the children now are insane. They run around screaming. They're all, they have, they're either on the spectrum or the ADHD or they're a little bit of everything. There's a lot of problems. People are having children much later in life and they're coming out with all kinds of issues. So these fat women with these unruly children are all turning to the only thing they know how to do, which is sit on their children to physically restrain them. Maybe they're not sitting on them. Maybe some of the women are leaning on the children. Where you see a child, you know, this emaciated, crazy child eating fun dip, screaming, ah, trying to burn his sister alive. And then the mother just leans on him to just kind of like stop him or sits on him. This is something that's going to happen. And this, this was sad because this woman killed her child. But this is, I predict, this, is, this woman is not alone. These women that I have watched make things like tater tot taco bake are sitting on their children to immobilize them. Dakota Wilson can be heard yelling multiple times when she realizes that the child has stopped moving. She then instructs one of her other children to dial 911. Uh, I was about to say her other child to dial 911. I was laying on him and he was acting and he was acting bad. Wilson is heard saying in the video. Wilson had three other adopted children living in her home. Department of Child Services spokesman Brian Heineman confirmed her foster parent license is currently suspended and under review for revocation. Currently suspended? <laughs> they, didn't even re they didn't even revoke it. She sat on one of her children and killed them. And they're not even just revoking it. They're just suspending it. She sat on her child. Can you imagine the other three that have to grow up now? They go on their first date and they, they go, yeah, well, you know, my family, this, that, and the other thing. And then they look down and they go, why? What's, what's going on with you? And you go, well, I was in a foster home and my foster mother sat on my brother and killed him. That is not a nice thing to, to walk around with for the rest of your life. I mean, it pales in comparison to the things in Kim Cheadle's head. But for most people... Watching your brother get crushed by your 400-pound foster mother is a negative, truly. It's going to stick with you. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm warning these fat women on Instagram who are making taco bakes, stop sitting on your children. Some of them may die. I know the kids are nuts. That's why I talk endlessly about putting them in the workforce or building prisons for them in the desert. But you cannot sit on as much as you want to sit on them to shut them up. You cannot. Pacify them with large meals. Give them sugar. Well, that's very sad, by the way. And this, this woman who... I just I can't help thinking of where it's just Kim Cheadle. So it's this warm, humid night in D.C. She's sitting on the back deck of her house in McLean, Virginia. She's drinking some cheap wine. This is not a woman who likes good wine or good food. This is, you know what I mean? She's she's a type that, uh, you know, she likes a burger. She likes French fries. When you're, when you're a dealer of death, as she is, um, you know, you believe the only important things are life and death. And they really are. So all this shit that we concern ourselves with, the thread count of sheets, you know, is the sauce the right thickness to go with the duck? She says, enough with all that faggot shit. She is not into it. 
Life and death are the things that animate Kim Cheadle. Only the big questions, power, life, death. Who's up? Who's down? Who's in? Who's out? And about four months from now, they're going to hire one of these fat Midwestern moms and they're going to go sit on Kim Cheadle. (laughs) They're going to go sit on Kim and she knows it's coming. Every night she sits out in that McLean, Virginia. And by the way, if she does live there, don't sue me because I don't even know if you live there. I'm just saying that's where a lot of you live. Wherever this woman lives, she's sitting out in the back, and she's watching this, by the way. Don't think they don't watch this stuff because no one's ever talked about her in her life. You know what I mean? And I'm like a C level, C, D plus, C minus level celebrity. This is big for her. I might even be C plus at this point. The point is, uh, I feel like I go up as YouTubers age, as they, they're all in feuds, these YouTubers they all have gray hair yelling at each other, and it's like, what, what's going on here? But this woman is sitting on the back deck in, in human Virginia, and every sound, she registers as the potential end of her life because she knows it's coming. They're going to hire someone to do it probably. And, you know, people do wet work. People do it and they do it well. When you leave special forces or one of these agencies, you leave with your gun and your skills and not a whole hell of a lot of money. And the reality is someone gets a call and they go, old Kim's time's up. And you go, well, I was expecting, and she knows it's coming. She's going to be sitting in the back deck, going to be humid, and she's going to be drinking a little bit of wine, and every thud of a cat, she's just going to look around and go, is it is tonight the night? Because she knows too much. She's been in the bowels for too long. She's been in the belly of the beast for too long. And this is how she leaves, and she knows that, and they might not do this immediately, it might not happen for a while, maybe they don't feel like it needs to happen, And she, but she knows it's a possibility. Like everybody who's been in her position, she knows it's a possibility. She, she knows, she knows, she knows, she's been in the rooms. She's been in rooms with people this has happened to. And she's been at their funerals. She doesn't even know how it happened per se. She might have thoughts or ideas. She's been at funerals of of people that this has happened to. And she's sitting in the backyard in McLean, Virginia. It's a humid night. It's mid-September, but it's still pretty fucking humid. The city is kind of coming back to life. And it's when she stumbles upon this episode. It takes her a few months. And she adjusts her eyes. She's drinking too much. And she's like, who's this fat fuck? And that's the last thought she has. Because at that moment, there is a bag put over her head. I am the last thing she sees. This voice is the last thing she hears. And then she goes to the place where all secrets are kept forever. And it's not a bad life. And by the way, having said all that, it wasn't a bad life. It wasn't a bad ride for her. It wasn't a bad ride. She was around. She did it. She did it. She did it. She was meant to do it. She would not have been happier owning a bakery in Georgetown. Sure, that thought will cross her mind as she's put in a van. But I will say that don't, um, don't re- Consider it now. You had a great career. And it is what it is. Heads will roll. You are, you happen to be the head. And it may soon be an actual head. I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying. I'm just wondering how these people operate. This is from reading lots of books and speaking to certain people. I don't know how they operate. But I imagine that she is the definition of a loose end. And when she gets a little boozy and starts talking and gets angry and starts feeling like her career was ripped away from her, When she gets to be a liability, she is going to go. That's my guess. That's what I think. And they're going to have a mother from Michigan who makes tater tot bake 
for her little demon children, go to Kim's house and sit on her because that's the most American way to die. There is no more American way to die than having your foster mother sit on you until you're dead. And if we honor this woman, and we should, even though she's a demon, we should honor her by allowing a 400-pound woman from Michigan who just made her family taco bake should be able to sit on Kim Cheadle Removing all of the life from her body because it is the most American way. See, that's the thing. All these people like Kim Cheadle, they don't know what they're even protecting. They fill themselves with all the bullshit. The history and the importance and the words emblazoned in our founding documents. But what you're really doing is you're just protecting people's right to make tater tot taco bake and sit and crush their children. Good night.